Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome and th thank you for joining the second day of Fluxnet ECN annual workshop. Uh, my name is Ho Jin Lee, and I will moderate today's workshop with Xiang Min San together. Before we start workshop, I will give you short notice for two hours of workshop. There will be two presentations from invited speakers followed by Q&A time. The workshop will also result in a community Q&A platform for mentor-mentee engagement in the Slack channel. I hope you've already uh, joined the Slack channel yesterday, but I also shared the link so you can uh, join the uh, Slack channel today. And during the workshop, all presentations will be recorded so that you can watch the videos uh, again at the Ameriflux YouTube channel later. If you couldn't participate in uh, uh, the workshop for day one, you can find the link in our Slack for the recorded videos. So after workshop, please share your ideas and opinions on the workshop by taking five minutes of your time. Uh, it will be met, uh, much helpful for us to plan future uh, Fluxnet ECN workshops. Okay, uh, today I'm very honored to have two great scientists from Australia and Malaysia. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Peter Isaac. Peter is Turn Ecosystem Process Project Manager and has been working with the Australian network of flux towers for the past 13 years, during which time he has overseen the implementation of the Turn OG Flux data path. He is also the lead developer of the PyFlux Pro program used to quality control gap fill and partition flux tower data. Before working for Turn, Peter worked as an air quality scientist for the New Zealand uh, Meteorological Service uh, prior to completing a PhD at Flinders University in South Australia. His postdoctoral studies were at Monash University in Victoria, Australia, where he helped to establish and run the North Australian Tropical Transect, a network of five flux towers spanning 800 kilometers in the Northern Territory, Australia. Today, he will review uh, gap filling and partitioning techniques and software. So, Peter, if you are ready, would you please start your presentation? Thank you Thank for you. that very generous introduction, Ocean. Uh, now, I think if I share my screen, then go to my presentation. Yes. And hopefully everyone can now see my screen with the first slide in place. I, I um, again, thank you for the, for the kind invitation to present to this group. Um, and I, I was wondering um, last night when I was trying to finish off my talk, how I would, how I would start and um, I, I thought I would start by by begging everyone's indulgence because I'm becoming an old person now. I'm 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 no longer young. Even I have to admit that now that when I look in the mirror, I look like an old man. Um, but that does allow me to reflect back on uh, my career. Now, I, I when I first saw the invite to attend this Fluxnet early career uh, session, early career research session, I actually thought it was because um, I was still an early career researcher. <laughs> Um, and it was only later that I realized I was being invited to speak because I was no longer an early career researcher. And I think that just reflects the fact that I'd never felt that I've had a career in research. And I don't think we ever do because you're, you're constantly moving, constantly changing and constantly learning. So I'm not sure that I've ever changed or, or, or ever moved past being an early career researcher. But when I was a real early career researcher, I was working for the New Zealand Meteorological Service in New Zealand. And that was in the 1980s. And I was incredibly lucky to be there at that time. And the reason for that was because in those days, all of the journals came by as paper, um, as paper documents, paper journals. And so every month we'd get a fresh edition of boundary layer meteorology. And for an entire day, all I would do is sit at my desk with my feet up on the desk, looking out the window uh, onto Wellington in New Zealand um, and read boundary layer meteorology from cover to cover. And I'd do the same for atmospheric environment 
I do the same for JGR and a few other um, art, uh, journals as well. And when I got stuck on something, I could go and ask David Ratt, one of the best boundary land meteorologists I've ever known. Uh, and I could ask him what was going on. And he would sit down with me and spend hours with me um, going over boundary land meteorology. And it was only recently that I realized young researchers these days do not have that luxury. They'd so time pressed and the pressure to, the pressure to publish is so strong that you don't get that time to sit back and do nothing but read journal articles. So I guess my first piece of advice is as much as you can, calm your life down to the point where you can spend at least a few hours every week doing nothing but reading journal articles. Um, you, you have to be across the literature in order to progress your own field. And that's the best way that I've found. I was extremely lucky to be able to do it at a time when life was slower. Try and find that time in your own life now to do it. Uh, so I've changed the title a little bit from, um, from what was advertised. Um, uh, I've put it up here, PyFlux Pro and OneFlux, uh, two applications for processing um, uh, uh, flux tower data, mainly for gap filling and partitioning. And uh, I'll talk about those uh, during this talk. Um, firstly, when I was thinking about how to write this, I, I went through and deconstructed the title because this is what we often do in, uh, as, as a scientist and a researcher, is you come up with a problem and you go through and deconstruct that problem and break it down into its component pieces. So I broke this one down um, um, into uh, four different or three sections plus a comment at the end of it. Uh, the original one was coding, conduct hands-on coding tutorials, processing eddy covariance data for cross-regional collaboration and standardization. That's a huge title. So breaking it down into three things, I got hands-on coding. Um, and I thought, well, I better say something about hands-on coding in that case. Processing eddy covariance data. I'm certainly gonna talk about processing eddy covariance data. Uh, collaboration and standardization is a subject very dear to my heart. And so I have some slides at the end of my presentation that will talk about those. And the last one that rather worried me was at the title slide that uh, Hoshin has just shown. It said, hear from experts on best practice. Now, I, I, I would never claim myself to be an expert or to know what best practice is, uh, but I will try and give you the benefit of what I've learned over the last, the last few decades. Um, let's start with hands-on coding. The first thing, and, and I, I, I may be preaching to the converted here. Um, some of you may already realize this and that's great, uh, but some of you may not. Um, what are we trying to do? So we need to have a clear idea of what we are trying to do. And I've put this up as something of a joke. Collect some data, do some processing, write a brilliant paper. I say it's a joke because um, we should know, I hope that we know in this audience that there's a lot more to it than that. But funnily enough, a lot of the people that I come across, a lot of the people who come to me for help or a lot of the people I end up working with in training, that's as far as they've got. That's as, that's as far as they've got in thinking this problem through. Somebody's put up a flux tower somewhere. They've collected some data. Now I want to do some processing, but I don't know what because I don't know what flux tower data is. And at the end of that, I'm going to expect to write a brilliant paper. Well, it's just not that simple, right? We have to do a lot more thinking and should do a lot more thinking before we start. So if that's your current mindset, hopefully by the end of this presentation, I will have convinced you that there are a few more things to think about. What does it start to look like? Um, and, and still ask the question, what are we trying to do here? I've put down here a kind of a path that I, um, I, I wish I had followed when I was young. <laughs> I try and do it now, but I'm still not successful. But the first part is to formulate a hypothesis. Um, we really need to say something or, or take an observation of the natural world around us and say, why is that happening? Well, I think it's happening because of this. And then you've got a hypothesis. Once you've got a hypothesis, then you can figure out what data is needed. And that's important because if you don't know what data you need, you're likely to go out there and collect everything that you possibly can think of. And that's going to be way too much data. So bring it down. What do you actually need to collect in order to answer your hypothesis? Then the next thing is, what kind of processing am I going to need to do to that data? And you're going to have to go away and read a bunch of papers, read a bunch of textbooks, find out what the processing is, but you're going to need to do that. There's no easy way out. You're going to have to do that to figure out what processing is needed because there are a lot of options and there's no clear single defined pathway. A lot of it, we know what we're doing. Some of it, we get into research. We don't know what we're doing so much anymore. There's a lot of different options. So Thinking about this will allow you then to decide what kind of processing you need to do. 
then the key is you only go out and collect the data that you need to answer your hypothesis. Obviously, these days we go out and collect a whole bunch more data. That's fine. We've got other research objectives alongside your own hypothesis. But you really want to stop yourself from going out and collecting everything, because if you do, you'll run out of time. At the same time, you've got to implement a processing path, this box in the middle. Very important, because we're going to have huge quantities of data, and you're going to have to have a method to process that sorted out. Then process the data, then do your results interpretation, publish the paper, and these days, just as importantly, publish the data set. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this um, uh, a diagram I've got in the top right-hand corner or if it's obscured. On my screen, it's obscured by the Zoom window. I'm assuming you're going to see that. I'll move that Zoom window down there. This is from Wikipedia. Um, this is the scientific. What I've described here is basically the scientific method. Form a hypothesis, yada, yada, follow all the steps. So that's basically the scientific method. And, and there's a little diagram over there. What are these two pictures down the bottom? Now, these pictures were taken in 1976. Um, on the Hay Plains of Australia in New South Wales at the Kungara experiment. It was the International Turbulence Comparison Experiment of 1976. It was one of the first articles I ever read in Boundary Lab Meteorology was to read about this kind of experiment. I thought it was terribly exciting. These people went into the field for somewhere around two to three weeks to take measurements um, of turbulence. And all of our work in fluxes is based on turbulent transport. This is where it all started. Um, they compared a whole bunch of instruments, um, investigated a whole bunch of uh, data processing techniques and signal processing techniques. And the thing that struck me was the entire experiment and the subsequent journal articles that followed, and they were hugely impactful. They were based on 33 runs, each run being 32.77 minutes long. So it was based on less than a day's data, a day's 48, 30 minute periods. This entire experiment yielded 33 30 minute runs of data. And the entire description of turbulence that came from that was based on that small number of runs. Why was it successful? They knew what they wanted to measure. They didn't have the luxury of data loggers, computers, and all the rest of it. It was all done more or less by hand. They had some computers, early computers in this experiment for recording data, but a lot of the work was still manual. It wasn't automated as we have it today. So they chose their conditions very carefully. They measured only what they wanted. Then they went away and spent months processing that data before they went any further. All right? That was how it was done in the old days. They could choose exactly what they wanted to do um, and the conditions that they wanted to work in. So a lot can be gained from a small number of perfect conditions. So think about what you're trying to do, then go ahead and do it. Don't launch into it, first of all. What are the first steps? Formulate the hypothesis you're going to test. That'll tell you what data is required and what uncertainty can be tolerated. That one's really important because there's a lot of uncertainty in eddy covariance work. The, the, it relies on a, a, a pseudo-random process, turbulent transport. It's going to be noisy. Then design the experiment to collect the required data. Now, what assumptions are required? This is a really big one. And I've written down there John Finnegan's paper from 2003. If you haven't already been to that paper, go back and read that paper. Get a hard copy of it. Don't use it on your tablet. Get a hard copy so you can carry it with you to bed. You can carry it with you to the bus. Read it again, read it again, read it again until you finally start to... It took me six or seven goes before I finally started to understand it. But when I did, it was great because he lays out in a very logical way what assumptions we are using to apply the eddy covariance technique. And if you don't understand those assumptions, you're going to put your sights in the wrong place. You're going to violate those assumptions you're going to get bad quality data. So what assumptions are required? Can we actually collect the required data with a tolerable uncertainty? Is that actually possible? In some cases, it's not possible. And by tolerable uncertainty, I mean, it's always going to be uncertain. There's always going to be noise in our measurements. Is that a tolerable level of noise? In some cases, it's not going to be tolerable. We may as well not do it. Then design your data collection and processing. What effect does the processing have on the data? Not many people have looked at that. Um, um, and, and we should. And then can the results be used to decide your hypothesis? If they can, fine, go ahead. If they can't, go back and redesign. Rethink your hypothesis, redesign the experiment. For my talk today, we're going to concentrate on the processing path um, for the rest of this talk. What does the processing need to do? Well, the first thing is we've got to convert all that turbulence data recorded at 10 or 20 hertz um, into fluxes averaged over 30 minutes. I'm not going to speak about that process because there's uh, Eddy Pro, Easy Flux, TK3, a bunch of others that already do that for you. 
Um, and there's a lot of good documentation about that process um, that you can go to and read. So that part is reasonably well understood now, um, or very well understood. Uh, I'm not gonna speak about it. I'm assuming you're starting from the point of view, I've now got fluxes averaged over 30 minutes or 60 minutes as appropriate. What do we need to do after that? We have to quality control the flux data and the supporting meteorological data. Why? Because the flux data is always noisy. Even if you apply the Edipro QC flags and leave behind only QC flag equals zero data from Edipro, it's still going to have noise spikes in there. Meteorological instruments fail. They've got an enormous number of failure modes and sometimes it will fail and look like real data and you won't notice you start analyzing it that it's not good data. So we need to quality control that data. We've got to apply any corrections, storage of heat in the layer above the heat flux plates, um, storage of CO2 uh, in, the, in the canopy, that kind of thing. Then we've got to determine a U-star threshold and apply that filter. We're using U-star here as a proxy for turbulence. We're assuming that when uh, friction velocity is above a certain threshold value, then the air is sufficiently mixed between the instruments and the surface that whatever happens at the surface is recorded by our instruments. We've then got a gap fill meteorology in fluxes because if we want to move on to doing um, partitioning and getting daily, weekly, monthly, annual totals, we need to do that with gap-filled data. So there are the basic steps in the process. What have we got available to do that? Um, there's a number of things out there. The ones that we're gonna talk about today, and, and Dr. Yusuf is gonna talk about this a little bit uh, after I've finished. Uh, the first one is R Eddy Proc, a bunch of R scripts. Dr. Yusuf will speak about that. Um, I'm going to talk about PyFlux Pro and OneFlux, both of which are written in Python. PyFlux Pro is uh, one that I've been heavily involved in in the last decade or so. Uh, OneFlux is uh, what Gilberto uh, Pastorello from Ameriflux and his team produced. A bunch of people from um, uh, Italy also involved in that from Dario Papales group. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that as well. The other one to mention is Tovi. Um, now, Tovi is available from Lycor. I think it's still on offer. Um, it's a subscription model. So you pay, uh, it used to be uh, about $1,000 a year, I think. Uh, I think they've got cheaper student versions available now. Uh, but you would pay a subscription and then get uh, to use uh, Tovi to process your data. Um, and and I, I can speak about that if people want me to, but um, right now I'm just going to, uh, to leave that and people can download the, the trial copy if they like and then use that. And lastly, what's something that interests me is that there's a lot of regional network tools out there. Um, MATLAB scripts that people have put together over the years to do their own processing. If we've got time in the panel discussion, I would love people to talk about that because um, different people have different ideas and, and I would never claim to have the best idea about anything. But if we listen to other people's ideas, then perhaps we can put together something which has got the best parts of all of them. All right? So those regional network tools are really important and really useful. And lastly, of course, you can write your own, which is what some of us rather foolishly tried to do. If you want to write your own, now this is, this is me warning you against doing it. <laughs> if you want to write your own, it's not all about the coding, all right? The, um, this is the hands-on coding part in the title. The temptation is just to dive in there and start writing code furiously because it's very satisfying to write code. It's very satisfying when it works. It's infuriating when it doesn't work, but when it does work, it's extremely satisfying. But it's not all about the coding. I work on a 25, 25, 25, 25 rule. 25% of the time goes into the design. 25% goes into the coding. 25% goes into writing unit tests so that you can test your code to make sure that it works. And 25% goes into the documentation. And if you're not going to do any of those steps, if you're just going to spend 100% on the coding, then you'll write something that will that, be of very little use to anyone else because you won't have any documentation, you won't have any unit testing and so on. So there's a lot of background work. Get some serious tools. You need a professional development environment if you're gonna do this, right? I learned the hard way, um, starting with a text editor to write Python. Um, that didn't last very long. On the right-hand side, in what I thought was going to be Star Wars style script, I've listed the technology stack that I use. Wing Pro is my development environment of choice. Um, Ultra Edit is a brilliant text editor that allows me to edit files and hex if I need to, so I can get right in there and change the binary for stuff that I can. I want to make uh, and I want to hack. Uh, Git obviously for version control, GitHub as a repository, Meld for differencing files, Typora for writing markdown scripts for uh, wikis and so on. Anaconda is the Python distribution. And lastly, PyInstaller and InnoStudio if you want to build installers for Windows. 
uh, and for the Macintosh rather than having people install their own Python. Be prepared to spend a long time doing this. PyFlux Pros had at least four person years. If I was honest, I'd say it'd have to be more like six person years um, over the decade or 13 years that I've been working on it. Uh, OneFlux is probably similar uh, when they put that together. Toby has had at least five person years put into it, right? So these things take a long time. Yes, you can write something quick and dirty yourself, but it's only gonna work for your situation. If you wanna build something that's, that's uh, gonna work in more places than one, it's going to take a long time. And at this stage, chat, GPT, and Copilot are not your friends. All right? You can't just tell a, um, a, a, a chat GPT session to write this code for you. Uh, I've tried, <laughs> and it produced something that looked like Python code, but it took me a fair time to patch it and make it work. Right? So at present, they're, they're getting better, but they're not good enough at present to write your processing program. Don't let that put you off. If you feel compelled to go and do it, then go and do it. Processing of eddy covariance data. PyFlux Pro. Um, PyFlux Pro is available from GitHub. Um, you can just Google GitHub PyFlux Pro and it'll take you straight uh, to the, the, the repository on GitHub. Um, other, otherwise, I've put the URLs there. Uh, it also has now a, a reasonably complete wiki. It's a work in progress, but it does at least contain some reasonable instructions on how to install and then how to carry out the processing at varying levels inside PyFlux Pro. It's got definitions of variables, uh, et cetera. So a fair amount of information is now in that wiki. It does have an installer available for Windows. I build one of those every so often. It means you don't have to install your own Python version. You can just use the single file installer available from GitHub um, and, and uh, that will install everything you need to run PyFlux Pro. Now the precursor to PyFlux Pro is described in Isaac et al 2017 from Biogeosciences. I've got the DOI there. If you want to use that, um, that was called OzFlux QC, same basic process, uh, it's just that PyFlux Pro has got a, a GUI bolted onto the front um, rather than just having a, a, a bunch of scripts behind it. So um, that biogeosciences paper is still pretty current. And there's some nice work in there, say it myself, there's some nice work in there looking at different methods of gap filling um, in particular. Now for this talk, I'm, um, I'm happy to speak to people in the panel sessions and so on about uh, gap filling technologies and so on, but you can also go to the literature and read about those. So I'm not going to spend my time or, or spend or waste your time today talking about stuff that you can go ahead and read somewhere else, right? So um, if you want to know about the details of the gap filling techniques, then by all means, go and have a look at that biogeosciences paper. We use it in turn to process the data from uh, 33 sites, might even be 35 by now. Uh, we release data every six months. We're going to move to three months shortly. Um, and we use PyFlux Pro to do all of that processing. Um, and then that data goes up. Um, on a, a DAP server. I'm gonna click on that link and hopefully that's gonna open. Yes, it did. Uh, so hopefully in my screen now you can see there's a web page here. Welcome to the Threads data server. So all of our data goes up uh, by site uh, onto a, a web page. This all happens automatically. Um, and, and anybody can then come to that website, browse the data and download what they want. So, right. right. Um, Next thing about last thing about PyFlux Pro, you don't need to know Python in order to use it. All right? You don't need to know a programming language. You can just pick it up and go with it. What I will say here, though, is that um, especially for early career people, for people that are just starting out in this, um, Excel can take you a long way. And you can do a lot of good work in Excel. But at some point, you're going to start bumping up against the limitations of file size and the length of time it takes to save the file and the number of times it becomes corrupt. At some point, you're going to need something else. And at that point, that's when you need to start looking into R or Python. Julia used to be around. Uh, there's a few other options there for scientific programming languages. You're gonna need to learn one of those to get far in your career. Um, I used to use a thing called, well, I used to use Fortran back in the old days. Then I moved on to a thing called Interactive Data Language or IDL. And then I went from IDL to Python. Um, R is a perfectly good alternative, but you are gonna to have to pick something up. So although no programming knowledge is required to run this, it's gonna benefit your career if you put some time aside learning how to program uh, in R or in Python. What are some of the features? On the right-hand side there, that's the PyFlux Pro GUI um, with what we call a level one control file opened in it. It's just reading in data at the stage, uh, applying a whole bunch of global attributes to that data uh, and then 
reading in variables, changing the name and the units if required, and then writing it out to a standard file format. But that's what the GUI looks like. It's, it's got two methods of operation, one interactive and one batch operation. By interactive, I mean you can use this to process data from a single site for a few months. Small quantity of data, single site. Or you can also turn it on as we do for 33 sites, 260 odd site years um, across an entire network. So um, in, in that case, in the batch mode, you don't wanna be pointing and clicking. You just wanna set it up and tell it to run and let it go. And that's what batch operation does for you. So the processing can be automated or it can be interactive. There's a lot of extensive quality control checks and post-processing. Again, you can go back to that biogeosciences paper and read about those, but there's a lot of, of good quality control checks that we've got built into that now. Then we've got U-star threshold detection. We've got both change point detection from Alan Barr's 2013 paper and the moving point threshold um, from Dario's paper from 2006. Both are available. You can use paired towers. So if you've got two flux towers side by side, you can use data from one to gap fill the other, or you can pick up data from an automatic weather station network. Um, we use the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, 650 AWS sites across Australia, or an NWP model, numerical weather prediction model. We use output from the Bureau's numerical weather prediction model to gap fill. Um, or you, lastly, you can use ERA5, reanalysis data available from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Uh, excellent product. Um, the NWP model that we use goes down to about 12 and a half K horizontal resolution, I think, um, at, at a 60 minute time step, ERA5 is about 30 K uh, horizontal resolution and, a, and again, a 60 minute uh, time step. But they can be used to get full and they're surprisingly good. The, the NWP models and the ERA5 reanalysis are surprisingly good for radiation, temperature, pressure, and so on. Not so good for wind speed, but very good for everything else. To gap fill the fluxes, PyFlux Pro offers a, sol a neural network. There's a, a paper there, it's called the Solo Neural Network, um, or Marginal Distribution Sampling, um, as described in, in Marcus Reichstein's paper 2005. So we've got a couple of gap filling technologies or techniques available there. When it comes to partitioning, partitioning is really about estimating ecosystem respiration. And there we've got three, ne three techniques available. You can use, again, the Solo Neural Network, um, to estimate ecosystem respiration with a, a few drivers, soil moisture, temperature, soil temperature. If you want, you can bring in MODIS data as well um, and use that to drive the neural network. Then there's the nighttime method just based on air temperature um, from Marcus's paper, 2005, and get a Laszlo's daytime method um, as well. So we've got three different techniques for estimating uh, ecosystem respiration. Finally, output goes to NetCDF files or Excel files, um, and there's a big range of plotting options. Why did we do that? I liken this to being in a cave in the dark with a torch, right? You don't get a sense of how big the cavern that you're standing in is. You turn on the torch, you see one tiny piece of it. You put the torch somewhere else, you see another tiny piece of it. I liken your data set to being inside that cave. And every time you plot a graph, you're seeing one part of your data set. The more graphs you plot, the more different facets of your data you're looking at. And if you do that enough times, you build up a picture of the entire cavern or your entire data set. So plotting is a really good thing. What's the general data flow? Um, you can start with fast data um, from a Campbell system or GHG files these days as well. Uh, run that through Eddy Pro, get yourself a full output file. Um, and then dump that into Excel, or these days PyFlux Pro will actually read those CSV files directly, or you can come in using some slow data as well. But there's six levels inside PyFlux Pro, levels one to level six. Each one of them is controlled with a text control file that you edit inside the GUI, and that contains all of the site-to-site -site variability. Code is standard, all the site-to-site -site differences are contained in those uh, level one to six control files. And the intermediate data is pushed through as net CDF files, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later on. That's the general workflow. In terms of some examples of plotting, uh, uh, all of these generated from PyFlux Pro. On the left -hand, uh, top left-hand corner here, this is for the Calprom site. And in South Australia, it's a, a Mali site. It's around about 300 millimeters per year. Uh, leaf ear index of about 0 0.5, 0 0.7, um, uh, uh, not, very, not very productive site. Um, and this is uh, CO2 flux, um, diel averages um, 
by month of year. So December, January, February in the top row. So that's summer, autumn, winter, and spring. Um, and it just shows you how that changes over time. The interesting thing about that for me is always that uh, in the summer months, CO2 flux, CO2 uptake is peaking at around about eight o'clock in the morning, and then the plants are shutting down by midday. Um, so they're running out of water, so they're closing their stomata and shutting down. Uh, we can do fingerprints. Again, this is Calperum. The big white band running through here was a fire that went through in 2014 and burned out the tower. It took them a couple of months to get everything back up and running again. Um, the interesting thing here was on the CO2 plot, um, you can see that it starts out in 2010 and 2011 with a fair amount of CO2 uptake. And that gradually, to, this was the end of the millennium drought in Australia. So there'd been very little rainfall in the years preceding, then very good, very heavy rainfall starting in 2009, carrying on to 2011. And of course, the plants sent crazy. Lots of nutrients stored up in the soil. The plants thought this was great, enough water to live on. And so lots of CO2 uptake. Uh, a few others there, I won't bother going through them. The last ones uh, down the bottom row here uh, come at level six after you've done all the partitioning. This is now cumulative net ecosystem exchange, gross primary productivity, ecosystem respiration and evapotranspiration as the solid line and precipitation as the dashed line. Uh, so we can start breaking those things down now and look at the interannual variability and also the intra. This site at uh, Cumberland Plain uh, in Western Sydney, it's a net source. Um, during late summer uh, and then goes through to being a net sink. And there's a fair bit of year to year variability in that as well. Enough about the plots, one flux. So one flux, it's available from GitHub, picture of the GitHub page up there at the top right hand corner. Uh, Gilberto uh, and a team of people from Ameriflux and from uh, Dario's Institute in Viterbo um, put this together for the FluxNet 2015 data synthesis. It's a massive effort. Um, I know because I've, <laughs> I've done something similar because I've wandered around inside the OneFlux code myself to figure out how it works and what it's doing. It's described in Gilberto's 2020 paper in Nature Scientific Data. If you haven't seen that paper, go and read it. It's very, very good. Um, it was used to produce the FluxNet 2015 data set. Um, it's becoming or has become the de facto standard. We get something like 80% of our data citations from OzFlux come from the 2015 data set, even though that's now seven or eight years old. And it stops in 2015. Uh, but we still get most of our data set citations uh, from that FluxNet 2015 synthesis. It's very, very important. And it's become the de facto standard. We might quibble, I might fight with Dario and say, I don't think you're doing some things correctly, uh, but it has become the de facto standard. Again, you don't need to know any programming in order to drive one flux. You don't need to get into the code yourself to make it work. What are the one flux features? OneFlux is much more tailored to batch style operations. It's not interactive. It's a command line. And I've given you an example of the command line invocation of OneFlux up there in the top right hand corner, right? Everything's done from the command line. Um, it's, it's not interactive. Once you set it going, this thing's gonna run until it either finishes or until it falls over with an error. So it's not interactive, but it is tailored to batch operations. So if you've got a large number of sites, as they did with FluxNet 2015 and a large number of site years of data to process, then this is your tool, automated. It'll work through that quite happily. Again, CPD and MPT use our threshold detection. Um, they use ERA5 for gap filling meteorology. Uh, it's not, it was available in 2015 uh, by an external process. They've almost finished making that an internal process now, which is excellent news. Uh, marginal distribution sampling to gap fill the fluxes. Um, works very well for short gaps, starts to struggle when you get gaps of um, a few weeks. Um, and if you get gaps of months, then um, it's just gonna give you climatology. It's gonna give you the average value. Um, Dario's position, he was horrified when I said that we had gaps of, of a few months. Dario's position was, uh, as a researcher, you should never have gaps in your data of that length. Partitioning, again, uh, we've got the nighttime method um, from Marcus Reichstein and uh, Gitta Laszlo's daytime method. Um, OneFlux has got a very, very good treatment of uncertainty. It does a really good job of trying to characterize the uncertainty. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later on. Um, it's a, 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 the development pathway for PyFlux Pro present is to try and make it do what OneFlux is doing uh, in terms of characterizing uncertainty in the missions. Uh, lastly, output goes to CSV files. Um, um, you get a, a flat file. 
uh, with a line containing the variable name and no other information, not even the units. If you want that, you've got to go back to the OneFlux website. It is all documented on there. Some plots out of OneFlux. Um, it doesn't produce a lot of plots. These are the only, well, these are three of the five that it does. Um, Net Ecosystem Exchange on the left-hand side, GPP in the center, Ecosystem Respiration on the right-hand side, and it'll do that for you at 30-minute, daily, weekly, monthly, or annual levels, and it puts in some colored shading areas uh, to try and characterize the uncertainty as well. So fairly basic plotting. Um, it's up to you once you've got the CSV output files to go through and do the analysis that you want to do on that and to do the plotting that you want to do on that. How do the available so gap filling and partitioning programs compare? So we've got at least three available to us that are relatively easy to set up and run. And the first thing that as physicists we should be doing is saying, how do they compare? Do they give us the same answer? Because if they don't, you know, I've got a problem. If they do, then I'm very happy. So I've gone through just to, for some entertainment in this presentation, um, and I've, I've compared three programs, uh, RED Proc, OneFlux, and PyFlux Pro. How do they perform on, on data from one of our sites? I'm going to use the same input data for all three programs. And my starting point is what we call a level four data product. It's been quality controlled, post-processed, and we have gap filled the meteorology using a combination of automatic weather station data and numerical weather prediction model data. And we're going to compare net ecosystem exchange, gross primary productivity, and ecosystem respiration. Comparison of RED Proc, OneFlux, and PyFlux Pro. On the left hand side is a time series of the daily total of net ecosystem exchange from those three processing packages uh, for the Cumberland Plains site. It's uh, dry sclerophyll, eucalypt, uh, probably around 600 millimeters a year, maybe a bit higher. Um, it does have a, a mistletoe infestation, so the trees are under stress from the mistletoe, um, but otherwise it's, it's a reasonably good site. Now, uh, PyFlux Pro results here are plotted in blue, um, OneFlux in red, and RED Proc in green. And we can see straight away that the three methodologies are totally independent. Once we've got that, the input data ready for them, they're, they're independent methods of gap filling fluxes and partitioning. Um, they all agree quite well on the basis of that time series. Yes, there are a few outlying points, but in general, you can't see the blue line because the red line's over it, and you can't see the red line because the green line is over it. So in general, the three methods agree quite well. They certainly all capture the same seasonality um, very well. And they've even picked up um, the fact that uh, from about uh, 2020, late 2020 onwards, We've had consecutive La Nina years in Australia, which means more rainfall. And you can see that the amplitude and the amount of growth is increasing, increasing in response to that rain. So they're both picking up the same seasonal trends there. And that's pretty comforting. When we start looking at the cumulative totals though, we get a slightly different story. Now I use cumulative totals because cumulative totals are very sensitive to small bias. You're summing up 17,520 30 minute points in one year. If they're all off by a tiny amount in the same direction, that difference will sum over the year, right? And it'll become a bigger number. So cumulative totals are very sensitive um, to, to small biases between different processing techniques. Net ecosystem exchange uh, at the top, GPP in the center, ecosystem respiration at the bottom. Units here are tons of carbon per hectare. Again, um, PyFlux Pro and RED Proc are the blue dots and the green dots. And they give us, this is summing now from 2014 up to 2023, so it's oh, nine years of data. They give us very, very similar answers at the end of that nine year period. Right? Independent methodologies, very similar answers, I'm confident. OneFlux, uh, sorry, OneFlux I've plotted here as red lines. And I've plotted from the fifth percentile of the U star threshold to the 95th. So we're using a range of different U star thresholds right, um, to establish confidence intervals on, on friction velocity threshold, uh, and then going through and doing the gap filling and the partitioning with each of those percentiles. And you can see that the fifth and the 95th are plotted in light red, and then the, the shading or the alpha increases until you get to the median value. Um, uh, 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 in the in the darkest shade of red. 
So the median value disagrees with um, PyFlux Pro and RD Proc, but the spread is quite large and the spread encompasses um, the results from those other two packages. So there's a lot of information there in that uncertainty. What's realistic? That site's got about 70 tons of carbon per hectare above ground biomass. All right. Now, if I've got a site putting on somewhere around 35 to 40 tons of carbon over a nine year period, and I've only got 70 standing to begin with, then I'm going to expect to see very clear visual signs of thickening in tree growth, more stems per hectare and so on. Right? We're not seeing that at Cumberland Plain. So some of these numbers here uh, at the upper range, around 35 to 40 tons um, uptake over that time period, and not really borne out by the standing biomass at the site. All right. So something's going on there. Some of these numbers we can perhaps rule out because they're not quite plausible. Down at about this, the 15 to 17 ton range where we're getting from um, RED Proc and PyFlux Pro, yeah, we could just about see that at the site. All right. You're not, you're not, it's not going to start looking like a rainforest after a decade um, at that level of uptake. So, so um, above ground biomass, I'm just flagging here that some other measurements are going to help us and above ground biomass is going to be one of them. What about the uncertainties? Because already PROC and PyFlux Pro both use a similar approach to calculating uncertainties. Um, how do they compare? And I've tried to capture this in these sets of plots. Net Ecosystem Exchange, GPP, and Ecosystem Respiration again. Um, the blue lines here are from R Eddy Proc. And you can just see a faint blue line and a, 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 a strongly colored blue line. That's from R Eddy Proc. And then we've got the same spread of red lines from one flux. Okay? And the uncertainty spread in RED proc is very small compared to the uncertainty spread in one flux. I, I, I don't know why that is happening. I didn't discover that until last night when I was doing these plots. Obviously, you need to look at that because uh, we're getting different totals over the whole period, almost a factor of two. And we need to investigate that. But we also just said, why is the spread? Why is the uncertainty so much less in RED proc than it is in one flux? I've got some numbers out there, just looking at net ecosystem exchange, again, in units of tons of carbon per hectare. Uh, for the median values, RED proc gives us 14.2, uh, PyFlux Pro is 17.5, uh, and one flux is up at 27.5. So it thinks the site is much more productive. But the range of uncertainties for one flux goes from minus 7.8 up to minus 43.6. The big range compared to the range of already proc minus 12.8 up to minus 14.9. I may be doing something wrong. That's entirely possible. My first thought when something doesn't look right is that I'm doing something wrong. It's just natural after so many years working in science. We will go back and investigate. Now I want to spend a few minutes, uh, and I think I've got time to do this, uh, talking about um, collaboration and standardization. Um, simply because this is in the title and simply because this is the area that I think early career researchers or in which early career researchers now will see the greatest change over their lifetime. In, in my career time, um, this technique has gone from being a, a, a pure research tool used sparingly in the field to investigate. Remember those 33, 30 minute periods sparingly used in the field to investigate particular processes to now being recorded at what six or seven hundred sites globally 24 hours a day seven days a week right? uh, it's become much more of a routine measurement um, process and that will continue because this is going to be an important path for the globe to reach net zero by 2050 right we're going to need to know what the biosphere is doing in terms of soaking up or emitting carbon dioxide so Collaboration and standardization is going to become very important um, over that time period as the whole process moves from being research to being much more of a monitoring, uh, routine monitoring style of process. The first example of collaboration and standardization is the FluxNet 2015 data set. It was the third synthesis after the Marconi and the last wheel data sets, very widely used. As I say, about 80% of our data citations come from people using the FluxNet 2015 data set. Right? That's a, a clear sign that it's the way of the future. 
be that popular and to be picked up by that much. It's unlikely that that will be updated because it's such a huge effort for a small group of volunteers to do. Right? It's too big an effort for a small group of unpaid people to go ahead and do in their spare time. How do we proceed? Well, Dario wrote a paper in 2020, it's in Biogeosciences. Um, I forget what the title is. I've got the DOI there. You can just search Papale 2020 Biogeosciences, it'll come up for you. Uh, in that, he proposes the FluxNet shuttle. Um, and the FluxNet shuttle is, I'll speak about that on the next slide, but this is one approach, one possibility, and it's, a, it's one that I favor um, to um, try and achieve an ongoing update of that FluxNet data set or FluxNet th synthesis. Um, in an effort for collaboration and standardization. The FluxNet shuttle. What Dario is proposing is a mechanism to continuously update the FluxNet data set. And I think that's a very worthy goal. The workload though is distributed. Instead of being done by a, a, a single group comprised of volunteers out of Ameriflux and ICOS, um, distribute the workload across the regional networks. So we'll do it, ICOS will do it, Ameriflux will do it, um, Asia Flux, career flux, whatever might do it, different groups across the world, each regional network um, will do its own processing using the OneFlux software. The OneFlux software still needs a bit of work, still under development, but when it's ready, uh, it could be rolled out relatively painlessly to all of the networks, run some training sessions, get people doing their own processing. Each regional network could then become responsible for pr producing its own updated FluxNet data set. We then make those results available from a server, which is administered by that regional network, and Dario's concept is the FluxNet shuttle goes around when you want it to, it'll go around, visit each of those servers, harvest the latest data and compile for you an updated version of that FluxNet 2015 data. Large amount of the process is automated. The workload is distributed across a number of regional networks across the globe. It's continuously updated. I think that this is the best way of sharing that workload. Um, it's not replacing what regional networks do now. So I'm, I'm not going to give up our own PyFlux Pro processing. I'm going to implement OneFlux and we've started doing that, but I'm gonna keep our own as well because I think ours does some things better than OneFlux. Just as an example, um, the latest version of PyFlux Pro um, will allow you to go browse a thread server. And you can see on our OzFlux thread server, here are the results of our own processing but I've also started to put up now the FluxNet, um, the results out of OneFlux. Take the CSV files, convert them to NetCDF, stick them up on our thread server. You can go browse them and have a look at them using PyFlux Pro. I think this is the best way forward um, for collaboration and standardization. Greater standardization will help with collaboration. So there's a bunch of other stuff we've got to do, not just processing data with the same package. We need a file format that combines metadata and data. Now, if I give you a, a CSV file with a single line of, of variable names in the, uh, at the start, you're going to be ringing me up every second day to say, what does this column mean and what are the units? Right? And I've got to spend that time telling you. With a NetCDF file, I can give that file to Hoshin and I can say, Hoshin, this is a NetCDF file that conforms to the Climate and Forecasting Metadata Conventions 1.8. He now knows everything he needs to know to go away, read that file, and do basic analysis on that data. He doesn't need to ring me up and say, Peter, what does this column mean? Because it's explained in the file. What are the units for this variable? It's explained in the file. Right? Self-documenting. I think that that's a good idea. Neon do a similar thing with an H, a, a file format called HDF5. Um, again, self-documenting. HDF5 is much more powerful and very complicated file format maybe a little bit of overkill for what we're trying to do. But we need to agree on some metadata conventions. I mentioned CNF metadata conventions. That's what we use within um, TURN and OzFlux. We also need to get some agreement on how to handle edge cases. OneFlux does a really good job of processing stuff that looks like it came from uh, Europe or America where they've got short gaps. We've got some really big gaps in Australia because we can't get to some sites for a long period of time. How do we deal with those? And how do we start using remote sensing data to improve the quality of the gap control, uh, gap filling and partition. Uh, and, and one flux at present doesn't allow you to do that. Um, we also need um, to resolve why we're getting different results from different processing approaches. Um, they don't need to agree, but we do need to understand why they differ. 
Uh, and I've, I've flagged some of that work in an earlier, earlier slide. Having said all of that in favor of collaboration and standardization, um, we don't need one ring to rule us uh, 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 out, out of all of the other rings available in Middle Earth. We do want the freedom to explore new approaches. That's really important. If somebody gets a rush of blood to the head and has a good idea, they should be allowed to go off and explore those approaches. If we just have one size fits all, one approach, that will tend to suppress um, initiative and we won't see new approaches come through. So we need to somehow find a way of keeping that exploration of new approaches going. And then at the end of it, I've got a bunch of references uh, that I've used in the paper. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Do you want me to stop sharing? I'll say yes. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Oh, I've used up all of my time too. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So, uh, our second speaker is Dr. Yusri Yusuf. Uh, Dr. Yusri Yusuf is um, associate professor in the environmental technology program of the School of Industrial Technology, University of Saints, Malaysia. He has been with USM since 20, uh, 2008. His research team is actively involved in eddy coherence measurement since 2014, when they got their very own system situated at the tropical coastal ocean. Currently, they are working on carbon and moisture exchanges uh, in their air sea interface. Today, he will talk about uh, our eddy crop for eddy coherence data analysis. So, Dr. Uh, Yusuf, if you are ready, uh, would you please start your presentation? All right. Thank you very much, Eugen. And uh, thank you for the organizers. So, let me try to share my screen. You can hear me first, right? Okay, good. Okay, let me start sharing. Can you see my screen? All right. Yes. Uh, well, so this talk is not going to really be a talk. It's more of a walkthrough, and it's there's some coding involved, so be warned. And I may be switching between our studio and also the presentation. So this might take a bit of time, but let's try to make do with what whatever we have. Uh, okay. So I'll be talking about the specific package that was mentioned by Peter in the previous uh, talk, and this is um, a deep dive into this package. So you could see how we use our eddy proc for gap filling, partitioning, and so on for eddy covariance, da uh, for eddy covariance data. So first of all, I need to acknowledge uh, that uh, some of the content is taken from a previous talk by Thomas Watzler. He is the writer of the RID proc package. And you can see his presentation in U on YouTube in that link, uh, also hosted by Emery Flux on YouTube. And there's some material given by him uh, for his talk at GitHub. Plus, you can read more about the package on the on their website, uh, on their official website. And uh, aside from using our eddy proc for uh, uh, within R Studio or within R, you can use their web-based interface where you can specify the file. You can you can upload the file, give the site ID, and uh, and set the U star filtering and so on. And after a few minutes, then you will get the results. So there's two ways for you to work with RID proc. One is through the web website. I think that's a good introduction for this. And other, another way, if you want to deep dive or you want to look at the details of the functions used uh, and also um, to customize your analysis, then you should be you, you should use the RID proc within R Studio. So uh, some of the things that you should be able to take away from this talk is that you'll be able to understand the, the functions within RID proc, although we might not be going through all of it because there's about 130 plus functions within it. And of course, we don't have that much time to go through all of it, but I'm going to at least touch on the ones that are relevant or maybe the first things that you'll be using uh, when you first explore RID proc. And um, you should be able to understand the workflow too. You'll be able to explain the analysis steps of the package and I am going to provide you the GitHub page for you to follow along. So let me just put it inside the, inside the chat so that you could go explore that as you listen. So, oops, give me a moment. Uh, this thing is covering. 
copy and it should be in the chat now. So uh, in the GitHub page, there is a presentation file. There's also the documentation um, that uh, goes through everything that I'm going to talk today because I might need to go a bit fast and then you might miss some of the things, but you can always go through it step by step and you should be able to follow along. All right, so what, what do we hope to get from RID proc? So one of it is uh, you'll be able to get fill data. Uh, this is the original uh, NEE value for the year 2006. Of course, we're using the data set provided uh, in the RID proc package. And um, you, you see there's a lot of gaps there. When you apply RID proc, then you, you uh, and then apply the useless thresholds and remove some of the, the the NAE that does not fill, that doesn't meet the threshold, and you should be uh, getting this uh, filled uh, NAE value. And also, you there is another option for you to also fill up all of the data uh, within all the data with uh, gap fill data for you to calculate uncertainty later. So uh, this is one of the products of the RID prop. Aside from that, there's also the partitioning part where you can uh, separate the NAE values to the GPP, uh, the Grice primary production, and also the ecosystem respiration. So um, this, this, the, this figure just gives you an idea of what you should see at the end of the tunnel or at the end of the analysis process. All right, so of course we'd be uh, delving into the code. So it will be easier for you to follow this talk or this walkthrough if you have some background on our language. Of course, all of you, I think, have uh, the necessary knowledge on edicovariance and some on just some basic information on net ecosystem exchange, especially how um, it can be separated into the GPP and the R eco, uh, the ecosystem respiration. Plus, uh, in terms of technical parts, you have some idea of what uh, of R and R Studio. We use that interchangeably, although I do recommend you to use R Studio. It's a lot easier to work with R Studio instead of the vanilla R, and of course, the package R Edi Proc. So. Even if you don't have this prerequisite, at least you from this talk, I, I hope that you'll be able to take away some um, ideas on how we work with R uh, and the R ID proc. Uh, because I'll go through the step, uh, through it step by step from the beginning as you get the data until you get that GBP, the plots that you saw just now, the fingerprint plot. So, what does it do? So, when do we actually use this? And it was actually nicely introduced by Peter in the previous slide, uh, in the previous talk. So, it's uh, it's more of a post-processing of eddy covariance. Uh, it's a package for post-processing after you've collected the raw data, the 10 hertz, 20 hertz data, then you would process it using eddy pro or, um, or any of the, usually I use eddy pro, but there are a couple of other post-processing, uh, pre-processing of uh, eddy covariance software available. And after you, you get the process data from eddy pro and you get the 30 minute data, then, um, of course, you would have to uh, quality control that uh, data by using either the 012 uh, quality control systems or the 09 quality flag by Fokin and Fokin and Mauder. Uh, after you remove all that data, then only you start to use the RD prop package. So this is more of a, the end of the processing step. And uh, so we use this RD prop package to post-process the net ecosystem exchange data, NAE. And we, we need to do this because uh, there are a lot of gaps in the data. And then if you don't uh, fill those uh, gaps, then your, your annual sums of the seasonal NEE or the annual sums of the NEE, uh, the yearly sums of NEE might be biased towards a certain value because they are missing values within the data. So that's, that's, how, that's the reason why we need to look at uh, gap filling the data. But of course, there are some considerations that you need to take before uh, you can use those. So you need to have a couple of um, uh, values of NEE before you can um, de decide on one or determine the uncertainty. So of course, uh, there's the, the last part of that is that you'll be able to determine the contributions of processes within the NEE, for, for example, the GPP and the respiration. So where we are at is at the end, actually, after getting the raw data, the process data through the Pro, and this is where you start to apply the RID pro package. So this is a schematic of, uh, well, by the way, when I present this, it's more of a user perspective because um, I didn't obviously I didn't write the package so we, we use it and um, when when I first started using it this is what, how I view how how the RID proc package works so you have your data here and then before you can actually use RID proc you will need to convert it to an RID proc package so this is a bit different than what you normally do in R because in R, you would have your data frame and you work in with the columns of the data frame. So it's pretty direct to the data, but within a RID proc package, you have to convert it to an RID proc object first. So uh, 
And uh, to do that, there is this function called the SAD proc. Um, this is actually initialization of the data to this object. And once it becomes this object, then you can start to apply the estimate U star scenarios, yeah, estimate U star threshold distribution, and so on, gap filling. Of course, there are, like I mentioned, 130 plus scenarios. So th these are some of the things that we will cover in this uh, walkthrough. Uh, aside from that, you need to give information that's not available within the data that you provide, such as the lat, lat long or time zone. And uh, this is needed, actually, if you want to partition it to the GPP and the ecosystem respiration. And finally, after you've done all of that and you've seen the fingerprint plot, um, you might find the, the plotting functions of proc to be a bit lacking. So you can export it to a form of a CSV or a text file so that you can do uh, further plots um, yeah, in MATLAB or in Python or any other of your programming language of, of choice. So that's when we use this X export results. Or you can just um, F write to a file. So the I will talk about again about this again in the next slide. But there are some uh, uh, parameters that are needed in the file. Of course, you could have additional parameters like uh, latent heat, sensible heat, and so on. But the, the compulsory ones are the date time uh, in a specific format the NEE, the U star, the global radiation, atmospheric temperature, and relative humidity. Oops, okay. So the workflow is like that. Like what I mentioned in the previous slide, there's a, we have to create the object first. So there's a bit of a work on data preparation. And sometimes I always tell people that if I, the, the like 90% or 80% of the work, uh, the tedious part of the, the analysis is actually preparing it in a format that could be used by whatever uh, process that step that you want to apply it on. So um, this will take a bit of time. So in this presentation, it might be like very fast where you have the data, it's all perfect and you run the analysis. But in reality, you would have to uh, curate the data, uh, um, curate, view it, plot it, and so on, replace any uh, missing timestamps, um, uh, make sure that they are within reasonable ranges before you actually create the object here and uh, apply it through this. So this is uh, might be a bit skewed uh, in terms of the the time that is required for you to spend on the analysis because you do going to spend a lot of time here and after that after you've already created the uh, object then you it's just a matter of applying the necessary functions um, creating the user threshold scenarios and then filtering the data using the thresholds gap filling it partitioning it within this step i guess this is the main feature of rid proc and finally to export uh, so first of all, uh, there are three main steps in the typical RID proc analysis workflow, like I mentioned just now. So there's this one, two, and I think this one, two, and three export is not considered a step. And the first one is to look for the use, use star threshold values. We have to check for underdeveloped uh, turbulence because the assumption of eddy covariance analysis is that the, 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 the turbulence is well developed. And um, you you but there are certainties if you were to remove the data based on the threshold. So you need to have a few quantiles of uh, U star values before you can decide on one or to determine the uncertainties with, for your estimates. So in this package, it can suggest threshold values of U star. Of course, this is customizable uh, depending on what you require. And after you remove the NAD values, then you get fill it um, due to the discarding of fluxes below the U star thresholds. And finally, if um, uh, you can separate the data into the gross prime production and the ecosystem respiration. So three main steps, and after that will be the exporting of the data. Okay, so let's go down into the code um, just to give you an idea of how it works uh, specifically. So uh, in R, so install the package. Um, of course, you, it's quite easy because it's on the CRAN repository. So it's just a matter of using this function install the packages RID proc. Uh, this is optional, by the way, but just to make it complete, so we can specify the re repository is at cran.usr project and so on. And after installing it, there might be some uh, other packages that you need to install as you install this, depending on how long have you been using R. Uh, and um, they will install it, but sometimes if it, it's not able to run and it specifies you the package that is not available, so you can do that. Um, you can do it. Um, uh, by package. That means if they say that yeah, tidyverse, for example, is not available, so you can install that package as tidyverse to complete the package before you can run the RID proc. And after, um, if you know R, you know that every time you uh, turn off the software and turn it back on, then you have to load the, the package using library RID proc. So just, just to get it set up. And okay, so I prepared this here to give you an idea of where we are at in the analysis because you might you might get a bit lost of um, all the codes that I'm going to show. So we are still in this uh, 
in this phase of creating the object. So the eddy convergence data that we'll be using this walkthrough are included in the package because it's a lot simpler to plus uh, it's a lot simpler to use with the, the, the data that's already perfect for the for the demo. But uh, you might need, uh, I mean, depending on your data set, like I mentioned just now, you might need to do a lot more on the data before you can actually use it within in the RID pro package. So for this demo, so it's, I mean, we don't want to, to, to spend that much time on that. So we'll just use this. So in the in the RID pro package, there's a DEGB example, and this is for the GBC, Germany data. And there's also the example, uh, the Etherant 98 data. So. I suggest if even if you don't have any data, so please explore this data so you can uh, these two data sets that's already within the RID prop package to get an idea of the workflow. Plus, uh, you can also get the data at Euroflux um, uh, Euro.fluxdata.eu. So for you to load the data into um, into our studio, it's just a matter of using this command data, the eg example for the GBC data set, and for the Torrent, it's this uh, this code. But if you are loading your own data in, then if it's in a CSV format, then you should use the read.csv function. And um, I, I, like I mentioned just now, when you load in your data into R, then you start to, you need to actually understand your data. You need to do a few time series plots, look at the ranges, see that there are not improbable values, remove those, make sure that the time steps are all um, in sequence, because if you, in the next step, when you create the RID uh, object, you notice that there will be a few warnings if they did not fulfill that criteria. Um, like the ones that I usually uh, would face is the time step is not complete. So there are, like say, um, the, the, at, 12, at the 12th hour and then the, and then 12.30 hour, and then the following hour is missing. So maybe when you look at the data uh, at a glance that you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice all this missing data, but then when you actually want to load it, then it will give you a warning set or an error say that we cannot create an object because there's all these missing time steps. So you have to solve that problem first before you can load the data into uh, into our, our edit problem or into our studio before you can create the object. And other than that, there's also if there are, the global radiation is negative, sometimes you know uh, because of electronic sensors so that you have. Uh, spurious uh, values, uh, electronic values that are not real, like say global radiation is less than zero. So uh, as you create the object, it will tell you that uh, the warning, there's a few RG values that are negative and then you should process that or you should remove that or change it to zero before you can load it. Um, other than that, uh, I guess the amount of data is also important. So you need to have at least three to four months of data before you load in, but I don't think it will flag that. But uh, that's all I can think of in terms of the warnings or errors you would see as you create the RID project. So keep in, keep that in mind as you load, because if you load this, then it's going to be uh, it's going to be loaded without any issues. So you might not appreciate the the steps that you need to take before you create the object in RID Pro. So next, uh, okay, let's take a look a bit of uh, this data set, the GBC, and also the Torrent data set. Uh, what I want to focus on here is that for both of, these, both of the data set, there are some limitations. There are some things that require you to, to change before you can use our Eddie Prop. Uh, for the GBC, notice that the if I show a summary of the data, so these are all the compulsory data, uh, variables, date, time, NAE, U star, T R RH, and RG. Notice that VPD is not there, and this is a good way, uh, it's a good example to use of some of the other functions that are available in RID Prod that you can use to add in the column. Uh, for the Torrent data set, uh, it's, it's different. For the Torrent data, sometimes, I don't know, I don't think people use this anymore because if you use RID, uh, if you use ID Pro, it will give us this, uh, this, this format. So usually if uh, you use ID Pro, then the date time is not going to be a problem, but maybe in the off chance that your data is in this format, where you have year, you have year and hour instead of the timestamp. So you need to process this to change it to the POSIX format. Uh, really depends on uh, the POSIX means the it's the there's a date time format within R. So uh, when I mention POSIX, it means it's in this format here, like the year, uh, month, the day, and the hour, and um, and then also the GM, uh, the time zone somewhere inside here. So if it has to be in this format. Uh, and if you have any other format, then you would have to change it to that format first. So that is in the pre-processing step. Um, other than that, all that is available. So there are extra data there. There's no problem as long as you have the necessary uh, columns. It's, it should be fine. So like I mentioned just now, uh, the parameters required for RDProc are the date time in POSIX format, 
the NEE or the carbon dioxide flux, the U star or friction velocity, some meteorological variables such as global radiation, uh, atmospheric temperature, RH and VPD. And, um, and if you have the, uh, the atmospheric temperature and RH, you can easily calculate VPD using a function within RID prop. So uh, like I mentioned just now, there are, uh, okay, for the Tehran data set, uh, the, the time is not in the right format. For the JBC data set, the, there's no VPD. So this is a good, good excuse for us to learn how to use some of the functions there. So the, the, this is actually the preference is just, uh, this is just what I use. So what is, can be considered useful for you will be the F convert time to POSIX um, to, so that you could change this, uh, this time format to, uh, to this format here. And um, also, if you don't have VPD, so there's this function, the cockpit VPD from RH and the air, and this is what we'll use in the demo. There are some conventions, naming conventions used within the RID proc uh, package. And, uh, but then I noticed that they are not uh, necessarily, they, they, don't, they don't cover all types of functions there because sometimes they use, sometimes they don't. So they don't use it as a rule, but in general, if you have, if you see a function with uh, that starts with an F, it's a it's a function um, that can be applied. Usually, it's not applied on the object, the RID op, ID prop object, but then it applied on the data frame. So, this is um, additional functions that aren't necessarily on the RID prop object. And I'll you, I'll explain more about this later. So coming back to okay, this one. So. One of the big headaches of um, an analyzing data, in, in my opinion, and from my experience too, is the working with time steps, uh, because the the code required for it can be quite uh, convoluted. Um, but there, but after some time, if you are used to working in R, then you start to memorize all these uh, symbols to use. I think it's similar with uh, MATLAB too. So. Here, there's a problem. We have the year in one column, the day of year in another column, and hour in another column. So how do we combine all this uh, into that format that, uh, that uh, we want, this format here, this format here? So we do, uh, luckily for us, within the RID proc, there is this package called, uh, this, the, like I mentioned, the F-convert time to post six. And then it, it understands that some of the time format could be in this, in this form, like the year, day, and hour. So looking at this code, I'm not sure whether you can see it. Uh, let me try to annotate here. So that's the function there. And then this is the data frame that we loaded. And this is where the magic works, this is the, the time format. So since we know it's in the year, day, and hour format, so uh, when we, we use this argument YDH, it understands that it's looking for the year, day, and hour in separate columns. And then you specify where's the year. The year is within the year column. The day is in the DOY column and the hour is within the hour column. So just by doing this, and of course, provided that there's no missing values inside here, then you should be able to convert the Y year day hour into the date time or the post six format. So from the year, still it's available there, year, day, and hour here. Oops, sorry. Oops, where is that? Okay, so within this, and uh, for this, then you get this. So notice that uh, the function uh, adds in the date time column and you don't have to worry about this. As long as you have this in the right name, then it should be good to go. So that's for the, the problem of having um, unsupported timestamp format. Now, how about VPD? So for VPD, uh, another excuse for us to use one other function, the F called VPD RH uh, function, so notice that uh, we don't we're not working on the R ID prop package yet. We're still working with the data frame. So this is the data frame that we load, and this is the column of R H. This is another data frame, and this is the column of T T air. So these are the T air. So these are the arguments for, to add it into this function, and you get the VPD. And this is another uh, a vector in the, in the workspace. And just to add in to the DEGB example here, I created another data set so that I don't confuse the original one. I use a C bind, uh, column bind to add in the VPD to the end of the, of the data frame. And once I see the head of, uh, I mean, just to get a preview of it and I'll see the VPD. So uh, notice that we're still working on the data frame, but we're not working on the RID object yet. So this is just to prepare uh, the, the data for RID prop. So now, um, 
So those, those are just some of the things that you might encounter as you get your data ready for IDProc. But once it's all there, it's all, all ready for you to change it to the object. So this is when you start to initialize the data into this object. Now, this is where it, it also gets a bit different than a traditional way of working with R, because when you work with R, usually you'll be working with the data frame and the columns. But in R ID proc, you change it to an object. So you'll be applying uh, functions onto this object um, and not uh, the, like specifying the columns within the data frame of the object. Sorry, the, 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 uh, the, the data frame. So before R ID proc can work on your data, the data has to be converted to an R ID proc object. And um, we create the data object from the, we just use one example, the GBC and we need to give an ID um, within the function itself. So let me just try to remove the, because it gets a bit messy here. I'm gonna remove the annotations, discard and restart the presentation. Okay. All right, so uh, first uh, you invoke the function and you give the ID, and then this is the data frame that you want to change to the R ID prop uh, object. And you can also uh, specify the columns within the, this data frame here. And the one we want is the NEE, RG, TR, VPD, and U star. And if there are no warnings, then you should see the EPROC DEGEB uh, object in RStudio. So let me just switch to RStudio to show you what I mean. Can you see my RStudio screen? Yes. All right. So uh, so these are what I mentioned just now. These are the data frames, um, the one that we traditionally use in any R analysis. But once you change it to the R edit prop package, then it'll become this uh, object here. So see, uh, object containing active binding. So there's two, there are two here. So for, for the normal data frame, if you click on this, then you can see the data in, in it. Uh, but uh, for the object, it's a bit of a black box. We can't see it. We have to use a function to see the data inside it. So that's where it starts to be a bit different and a bit um, confusing if you're new to the RID prop package. So just keep that in mind. So be working with this object uh, in the next steps. So where's my presentation? All right. So we're still creating the object. Um, we need to provide the location, the let, the long, and the time hour zone. So by default, because within the original data, there's no um, there are no uh, location information, there are no time zone information. So if uh, if you want to add in, so you notice that we apply this this uh, this function that we didn't already prop onto the object here without telling it exactly which column you're you're referring to. So if you just want to view it, it's just this s location applied to this object here. And you, you see this all and A. And if you want to add information to the object, so it's just uh, adding that, uh, using that function as set location info. And these are the arguments, the latitude, longitude, and the time hour zone. And you don't have to, you, you don't have to add it to a value or, or, or what do you call it? Not add it, define a value from here. You just, once you use this function here, then it will add this information into the object. So that's one of the things that are a bit different because in R, Notice like, for example, here, uh, if you calculate the VPD here, then it will calculate the, the values and then it will put it inside this, this uh, vector. But uh, for, for RID proc, so it's just, you don't have to define anything. It's just, you set this location, use this function on this object, put the information there, then it's going, once you check it again, then you will see the, the values inside the object already. So that's, that's what I mean by it's a bit different uh, using with this object, working with this object. And this is for the Tarant. Uh, Tarant does similar things, so it's just creating the object. Um, so I can probably skip this because it's the same idea as the GPC data set. All right, so now let's go into the, the guts of uh, our ID prop, ID prop package. So it's the youth thresholds. So for this uh, data set, um, it's well known, it's an old one and it's used a lot in demos. So we're gonna use the same thing to get the point across on how to use the RID prop package. So for, let's give a bit of background on the GBC data set. It's an agricultural site and the surface condition changes depending on the harvest and the season. So uh, because the surface change, the friction velocity will also change, which means that the u star threshold will be different depending on the season. So it also means that the u star threshold needs to be estimated for each season. 
because the change in surface surface cover. And uh, sometimes you can visually inspect the data. If you know your data well, then you'll be able to uh, come up with your the start days of when the season occurs. And uh, this needs a little pre-work uh, because sometimes you need to visually inspect the data when uh, when the surface change. So for example, looking at the plot, I'm going to skip a few straight away, a few slides straight away. You can see this is the NAE data. And clearly you can see the changes in the NAE depending on the season here. So this is basically the lines here that you see are the start days of the season. And we want to capture this uh, so that we can tell our ID proc so to, to calculate the use to thresholds depending on, uh, on the season. So coming, going back. So this is the information. Uh, in 2004, the, the first season is from day one to day 70, and the second season from day 70 to 210, and so on until 2006. So this is uh, additional information that you need to provide to the function within in RID Pro. Um, this is standard R, um, just to add in the data into, um, into a data frame. Uh, usually what I do, of course, there's a lot of ways, a million ways for you to do this, but for me, I would just specify the day um, in one column. This is the information that you saw in the previous slide, and then the year um, in the previous slide and put it in the data frame, assign it to this DF start days, and then just to view it, this is what it looks like. So in this format, it's ready for us to feed in, it's ready for us to use this in the in the R -AD proc function for the U star S special estimation. All right, so what it does here is uh, we we need to tag basically the rows of each um, the rows of uh, of data in the data frame to a factor. So uh, there is a function uh, there is a function within RID proc this US create season factored Y day year and then this one would basically just get the data of the start days uh, and the the year and then it will look at how many columns you have in the original data in the data frame that you want to analyze. And then it will create a factor. So using this, it will say that okay, for season one, 2004 season one, there are 3,312 um, rows. For season two, 2004 70, there's 600, 6,720, and so on. And this creates a, a vector of this many, this many uh, rows, like 300, 3,312 plus 6,720. You will add all this, and you get the same number of rows as the the data frame that we want to analyze. And we combine this factor to the data frame so that we know that okay, if a certain row has this uh, has this factor, it means that it's within that season. So this is how uh, the R ID prop package understands that this is a particular season, and it should analyze it separately for that season. So basically, this is just uh, creating a vector, a factor, so that you can combine it with the with the data frame um, of any ease and so on, so that you you know which season um, each row is in. Um, yeah, so this is optional just to view the data. So just to confirm, it's always good for us to see um, when uh, the season, to just confirm that maybe the lines that you create somewhere in the middle, so you know that's wrong, so you can uh, nudge it to the left to, to see. But it's always good for you to, to verify that the seasons are, are logical. Okay, now, so let's look at the use of threshold distribution. Um, one of the reasons why we use RID proc, uh, we don't code it ourselves, uh, because it's a lot easier to do this. Because if you want to code it yourselves, then you would have to um, uh, apply the bootstrap uh, methodology. You have to uh, determine the classes uh, for each bootstrap, and then and calculate all that, and verify, and and and, and create the plot, and so on. So it's a lot of things. So instead of uh, doing that so, re and reinvent the wheel so you could just use this uh, built-in function in RID proc to calculate for you this U star threshold distribution. So we will estimate the U star limit so the thresholds using this S estimate U star scenarios function and for you to use this S estimate U star scenarios function you need to have the season factor that we created in the previous slides and also the important important parameters such as the NAE, the air and season factor within the function. By the way, this is what it does. Um, so I know it's pretty small, so let me try to, um, to zoom in for you to see what it does. There's just not enough space in the slide. Okay, so um, what you, you don't actually see this plot when you run the function, but if you are interested to see what it does, so you can see if, um, it 
calculates the NEE and it, you know, it, it plots the NEE against the U star and it tries to find where it starts to normalize or starts to stabilize and determines that as the threshold. So it does this in a bootstrap manner, which means that it will um, randomly take values within the data, data frame plot NEE against U star and then it will then it will see where it uh, where it starts to stabilize, and then that will be the U star threshold. And it does it a lot of times. And you can tell the function uh, how many times you want it to do it. So it could be 30, it could be 100, it could be 2,000, because it does it randomly. Uh, it picks data from the data frame randomly. Uh, and um, aside from that, uh, that's the general uh, general workflow. Aside from that, there's also the, they also estimate the U star threshold depending on the temperature class. So the default is seven classes. So here I only uh, show two, but there's actually five more here. Uh, but uh, if you want to see uh, like per class the three user threshold, so you can you can you can there's actually a function within the RID proc you can uh, plot it and then you can see how how it changes. But this is in essence how it's it's calculated this user threshold. So let me go back. Now, once we have the use of threshold and we just use 30 here, of course, you should use a lot more. Um, and the default is at 5%, 50%, 95% quantile. So there's the, the U, uh, U star value, low U star value at 5% quantile, at 50% median, and 95%. And um, if you don't change the arguments here, you can actually change it to 10, 20, 30%, depending on what you need. But if you don't specify, then it will use this uh, the standard ones. Um, and you tell how many times you want it to bootstrap and you mention what is the season factor. And notice that, again, you apply this with the arguments here and you add it to this EPROC, uh, you apply it on this EPROC, EEGEB uh, object. And after all of that is done, then you get this output. Uh, you, you see that this is the, the general information uh, of the use of thresholds uh, at 0 0.16, at 5% quantile 0 0.12, at 50% 0 0.15, at 95% is 0 0.18. And you can also see some of the settings used. Like I mentioned just now, there are seven temperature classes used. So um, although you can actually change this, and this is one of the reasons why we use the RID prop package within RStudio instead of the web, because um, some of these things are customizable. You just need to change the, the arguments within the function and you'll be able to customize your own uh, your analysis. Uh, so yeah, so you, this is actually additional information that if you want to know more about it, I, I suppose you need to read the Papal 2006 paper that talks about how this methodology is, is done. So now we have the, the use of threshold values and uh, we need to ensure, okay, yeah. So now notice that you add the data to the original data frame. So uh, this function here, it will uh, prove create a few columns, and those columns are added to this EPROC DEG, this, uh, this object here. And let's say you want to get the data out from that object. Um, so this is important. You, you can use this function called S export data. Uh, there's actually two parts here. There's one for data that, uh, that takes out the data, the original data that you put in, and there's also the results. So if, let's say you want to stop stop at the use threshold values, then you use this uh, results here and you can take out the data, the, the use of thresholds and so on using this. Or if you want to verify the data that you add in is the same one, then you can use this. So these two uh, functions are useful later when you are, when you, let's say you want to export the data or you want to use the data somewhere else instead of inside RStudio. And uh, just now I showed you the, the plot. So this is one of the functions there. So let's look at the results. So what it does by default is that it will calculate the user threshold for all of the data. You have this U star 5%, 50%, 95%. And since you specify the season factor, so you also look at it per season and also looks at it per year because there's three, three years involved, um, three years measured uh, worth of data in the date, worth of data. So um, if let's say you are interested in the seasonal, um, if you use the default, it's actually the default settings, then you'll be using the per year or the single one here, but uh, or per year actually. But if you are interested in the seasonal, which we are right now, so we should change the settings. We should tell our report that you are interested in the seasonal values instead of uh, the yearly values. So to do that, 
um, to, to see the results, again, you apply this function s get u star scenarios uh, onto the object and you see the values here. Notice that this is per year. This is the default. So if you're not careful, then you might be using the annual uh, u star threshold values instead of the season. So to, to change this to something uh, that you want, which is seasonal, so we, we can use this function called use seasonal u star threshold on the object and check it again. And you notice that this is now per season. So be careful with that because uh, if, if you just fall, go through the steps and you might be getting something that you're not expecting or something that you don't want. Uh, so Okay, so now I think, uh, I think the, the internet now is uh, a little bit slow at the uh, at user is freezing. It seems maybe we can wait for a while and uh, to see whether his internet can automatically recover. All right, so while we are waiting, uh, if there are questions from the audience, please leave your questions on the chat box so that Peter yeah, can answer to them. Uh, no worry, no worry. I'm rushing through it anyway. Uh, how many more minutes do I have, by the way? Uh, um, half an hour. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, we're right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. so, suddenly, I lost connection. Uh, I I noticed, but when I didn't see your screen, so where did where did I drop off? Is it here? You can go a, a little bit, uh, bit forward. I think uh, it was on the on the season seasoning season season fact. Uh, maybe go a little bit. Of, yeah. So I think it's here. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Internet is acting up today. Mm -hmm. I did lose connection just now when Peter started his uh, his presentation. So no I worry. No worry. Okay. Never mind. I still have enough time. So I was talking about if you do not spell uh, our Eddie proc uh, to use seasonal values, it will use the annual value. So um, before you move on, you should check whether they are using the actual um, use our thresholds that you want, the, the seasonal ones. So you can actually see uh, the, the use star threshold used by using this s get u star scenarios. Um, you can some of the names are explanatory, self-explanatory, which means that you'll be able to understand this. So it doesn't calculate anything, it's just showing. So uh, when we apply it again, the idea is always applying the function again uh, on to the object. And you see that the use of thresholds for this, even though there are different seasons, they are actually using the annual year. So this is the default. Um, but what we want here, for the, at least for this example, is to use, this, is to use the seasonal use of threshold values. So to tell our proc to use the seasonal threshold values, we use this function called the US seasonal use of threshold. Um, mind you, the, the typo here. Um, so, well, it's already coded that way. So you, this is the only way that we should uh, spell it. But just, just careful unless there's autocorrect uh, going on here. So uh, you you use this uh, function to tell RA proc to use the seasonal values and just to double check whether they are using the seasonal values, then you again use this s get u star scenario. So notice now for every season, there are different u star values, uh, u star threshold values. So compared to what we see here, so there's only one U star values per the, for the same for the same year and then for every season. Okay, so now that's done. Um, now we will, we, I mean, our ID proc would use the threshold values and anything below the U star threshold values, it would discard the data. So you have uh, data that has more gaps after the gaps that you've already introduced because of the quality control. Um, pre-processing step that you took before using RAD prop. So uh, how, how does it get fill the data? How does RAD prop get fill the data? So, well, it uses, uh, we, for the code, it uses this function SMDS get fill by U star scenarios. Uh, it will filter the data using U star and, and then also get fill it. So it becomes like one step. So that's why there is data filtering uh, using the threshold and also get filling it directly. Uh, and how it does this, of course, I'm not going into the details. If you want to know more about it, you should read the paper. 
uh, by Rexton and also um, by Lestop. Actually, it's partitioning, but then the Papal, if I'm not mistaken, 2006, that uh, deals with uh, this uh, procedure. So it uses this uh, concept of MDS, marginal distribution sampling, which it combines both lookup table and the mean diurnal course. So the lookup table is that they look at the combinations of meteorological parameters. If the combinations of meteorological parameters are the, are the same, then it should give the same NEE values. So you build up the table and then it would, uh, if there is a missing NEE values, you look at the combination of uh, meteorological values. And if they're similar, then it will get filled with that NEE value. So um, that's basically how it does it for the lookup table. And the other way is that if you don't have any uh, enough meteorological data for it, then you look at the mean diurnal cost, which means that for any particular hour with the same meteorological, we're assuming that the same, the same meteorological conditions persist for that hour, then the next day's hour should have the same NEE. So these are the assumptions made uh, for the gap filling that you should be aware of. So that's the reason why if there are many days uh, of data that's empty, uh, then you have a problem because you might not be able to use the lookup table and even the mean diurnal cost uh, to, to gap fill it. And it will still try to do it, but um, of course with caveats and you need to be aware of it. So that's, that's one of the rules that you, if there are gaps in data, at least there are sporadic gaps, gaps in the data um, for you to fill and not like huge chunks, especially if it's per season and the, 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 and the, the distribution of the meteorological variables are too different from one season to the next, then they won't have enough information to get filled the data using either the lookup table or the mean diurnal cost. So that's why there are additional quality flags in it. So on top of the quality flags uh, introduced by EDIPRO, like the 0, 1, 2, and 0 to 9 uh, quality flags, um, there's also quality flags within RID proc for the get filled data. So if it's using the original data, then it's the, the highest quality at zero. And if it gap fills the data, but then there are more parameters and the time window is shorter, shorter, then there's not a lot of gaps in terms of time, then it'll be at one. And if it's like don't have enough parameters and there are longer time windows, more gaps in it, then it'll be more than one. So it could be one, 1 1.5, two, and so on. It's like more than one. So um, you should, I mean, if you have large gaps in the data for many months, then you should see a, a lower, a higher quality flag value for those gap fill data because already proc will gap fill the data. And the function also calculates, uh, so why we do this? Um, uh, okay, sorry, before that, the, the functions also uh, replace the original value with uh, the gap fill data so that we can calculate uncertainties. So one is, uh, one, one column would have the NEE without any get, get fill data. The second column is the like NEE with get fill data, but with the original data. And another, and the third column is where you have the, all of the NEE changed to get fill values. And they have this one column with all the get fill values because uh, we want to calculate uncertainties of that get filling methodology. So for NEE, uh, there's this uh, argument called fill all true, which means that you will create another column that has all the gap fill values uh, using this methodology and will replace all the NEE. So some uh, introduction on the, 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 the naming convention use for the columns. We have a NEE 05 F, okay. Let's just focus on F here. So if it's F, it's uh, the original values together with the gap fill values. And if it's F all, it's the original, if all the, is the get only the gap fill values and the QC is for the quality controller zero, one, and more than one. And I think I will go here and show you exactly what I mean. So this is the additional um, this is the additional columns added to the R ID proc object. Um, and I use here the S export results uh, function to show this. This is to display. Um, I don't, actually to export the data and also use the call names to look at just the column names. And you see all these uh, additional columns added. So for example, if any e u star f here means that not get fill, it's just um, because of the u star, it's not get fill. And another one, like say any e u zero five, okay, maybe uh, not this one, this one, yeah. So just now any e um, original data with the get fill data, but using the u star threshold at 5%. And this one is any e quality control of the get fill data. And this is if all of it was to change to get fill data for, for the 5% for the control. So here you see 5, 50, and 95. Okay, you might re not remember what it means here, 5, 50, and 95. It's the one that we set previously here. See, 
50, uh, 5, 50, and 95. Now, if you have other uh, quantile percentages that you want to add in, so they will add in more columns. So if, for example, if you had 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, and so on, so you're going to have as many uh, columns for that quantile. Um, but here, if you use the default, it's just this three. OK, so um, now we have all these uh, values, uh, additional columns in the RID proc. So uh, let's take a look at what it means by the use of threshold. So uh, I need to I need you to remember this. So you notice that these are these will have different use of threshold values. And if we were to plot the use of threshold values per season, you notice how they vary. So coming back to this one, you can see okay, for the first season, this is the use of threshold value use uh, for the gap filling, uh, for the filtering and the gap filling and all that. So notice that they change. And it's always nice to uh, relook uh, or take a look at the data by plotting it so that you know that this is what you expect. Although this is not compulsory, it's just um, I think it's a good practice for you to just always, every time you, you run analysis, you should always uh, try to plot some columns so you can see that they are reasonable. So let's look at the results. So if before you filtering, uh, you start filtering, you see uh, this is the data. Of course, it's it's all packed, so you can't really see the gaps there. But after you start filtering, then some of the gaps, uh, some of the data is actually removed. So this is the data not removed because of the use source threshold. This is the data removed because of the use source threshold. So there's more, there are more gaps here. And this is after gap filling using the original flux with uh, the use of at 50% threshold. Um, it's filled, and this is if you fill all. It means you replace all NEE values with uh, get fill data. So notice how they are different. So it's a bit more subdued because um, this is not real NEE values. It's just get fill based on the on the lookup table and the and the mean diurnal cost uh, method. So you have all of this because you want to calculate the uncertainties uh, due to this process. So that's the reason why. Uh, we, we do all this, we, we need to have this uh, all, we need to have up to, fill, up to, up to filling with uh, the gap fill data and before. Okay, so, um, well, one of the highlights of RID proc is that you'll be able to use one function to create the fingerprint plot. I mean, this is a very famous uh, plot and it's actually a very good way for us to visualize how the NAE change. And this is what happens to the data as you gap fill it. Um, this is for the year 2006. Uh, again, this is actually this, the export because we're not doing any analysis. We're just looking at the data. So without uh, gap filling, this, this is the data. And this is after gap filling using the lookup table and mean diurnal cost. And this is if you use uh, all gap fill data, removing all the NAE val original NAE values. You can see the difference there. Um, of course, there are other ways for you to export the data, uh, export the results. There's this splot fingerprint, and it will create a PDF. And I'll show you this example here. Uh, where is that? This is oh, here. It is. Oh no, this one. So the docs, the results, miscellaneous figures. Let's go back, back down. This is it here. Where is it? Not this one. Yeah, here. Um, it's in the form of PDF. Um, and it also gives you a color bar here, to show you. So you could either do it with an R uh, individually, or you can just create a PDF. Although the limitation of this one, and one of the reasons why we need to export the data to, to a text file or a CSV file later, because there, there's not much uh, customization options for the plots. So if you want to play around with the, the color bars and so on, or change the, the fonts, so it's easier if you were to export it and then use the traditional way of using R to, to plot the data. But if this is fine, then I guess you can just uh, use the default uh, layout. Where's my presentation? Okay, so we're about almost at the end. Um, let's look at the partitioning part. So we're, we're done with the use of threshold data filtering using threshold. Now we are gap filling it and we already gap fill it. And now we're looking at partitioning. So there's two parts to it. There's the uh, GPP and also the ecosystem respiration. And this is when, this is when the, the, it's important for the data to have the location and also the time zone. 
because uh, RAD proc uses that to estimate day and night hours important for the functions uh, of partitioning in the RAD proc package. So we already did this in step two, but uh, you don't have to do it from the beginning. So if I say at this point, you don't, you find out that you forgot to add in the lat one and also the time zone, you can always add it using the S location function that I mentioned uh, in the beginning. And uh, before you partition, you should fill up the empty meteorological data. Uh, so for RG, the air and VPD, uh, we get fill it uh, using the, the lookup table and the mean diurnal cost, but we don't have to, we don't have to uh, get fill it with all the, I mean, fill it with all the, uh, with the gap fill data because we're not looking at the uncertainties for this. So we fill it all with gap fill data for NEE because we want to, we want to, sorry, sorry. We want to, uh, we want to calculate uncertainties, but we're not calculating uncertainties for, for the global radiation T air and VPD. So but there's no point why we should fill it all. Although if you do fill it all, then you can, but it's just that if you want to calculate uncertainties, but if, uh, for this example, at least we're not looking at uncertainties of the RGT air and VPD. So um, there's two functions, mean functions within uh, within our proc. There's this uh, Reichstens method uh, and also the Laslock method of partitioning, and there are more granular uh, functions within. Um, although that, like, like I mentioned, there's 130 plus functions available. So if you want to fine tune or you want to adjust some of it, you can uh, look at them. Uh, look at this all these different functions but for this just to get it i mean I, I would suggest if you're just looking at partitioning and get filling it you should just follow this flow understand the data first and later on when you find it doesn't meet your expectations or you do not feel that it should behave in a, in a certain way in that way then you can go deep dive into the the the, the individual functions that make up all this uh this uh this bigger functions but for this it's just a, for the partitioning it's quite simple it's just by applying this as um, MRX flux partition, you start scenarios because you use the different scenarios onto the object and that's it. I mean, you already applied the partitioning. It's, it's that simple. Um, and it will add results. It would add uh, more columns to your data. So remember just now, we, we, we see this up to 46. So this is after the threshold. And after, after the partitioning, they add either, even more. So this is something when I was looking, when I was first started to use RD Pro, I didn't realize that uh, where did the results go? So I didn't realize that it's actually added automatically because we are so used to um, after applying something, we should define something else to see the results. But here it just automatically adds into that. So uh, this is one example of that. If you don't look for it using this as, as export results, then you don't actually see all these additional columns here. So. Uh, every time you add in more analysis, you have more and more columns, and uh, you'll see that, that that later. Okay, for this one, we see after, from columns 46 to 104. So where's 46? So yes, so columns from uh, 46 up to 104 are the additional columns added by the by this this function here. And uh, maybe what's of interest would be the GPP, the gross uh, and five, at the different thresholds the F here and also the R ecosystem, uh, the, sorry, the R eco at the threshold, U star threshold. Um, again, always uh, good practice for you to plot after you, you've uh, produced the, the results. So you should always take a look at the data. Uh, so this is the result of that. Um, so here I, I mentioned that the, for ecosystem respiration is this red line and the GPP is this line and to see whether it fits your expectations. And to plot that, okay, uh, maybe this is something, uh, how do you actually plot per data frame for people who are used to R? Because if we want to plot something, we always have this, the name of the data frame with the column. Uh, but if you want to plot directly from the object, then you should use this S export results. So this is the object export result, and then the, the specify the columns here. So the additional step here is this part here where we, export the results from the, the object, and then you specify the column. So how do you, which columns are, are there? That's, that's why we, we do this. So uh, this is very useful uh, working with the object, unless you want to export it to a data frame and apply, but then it can get a bit tedious because you would have to do that every time. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, by the way, this NREC here is just to show for two days so, so, um, so that we don't see the entire data frame for, uh, for three years. So at least it's manageable to see it. So that's why we put here for two days. 
Okay, for less lock partitioning, uh, less lock partitioning, it's the same except for it's a different methodology. And um, once you apply that method, uh, that function, I think it's this SGL flux partition U star scenarios onto the object, then you see even more columns. So it gets even smaller. So let me try to zoom in here so you can see. Oops, can I go down? Right. So from 104 here up to here, these are the, the, the new columns because of the application of that function. Um, so we have the GPP05 here. That's that's uh, from the Braxton's um, function. And the, the similar ones for for the less lock one is this one, GPPDT. There's this DT, DT uh, suffix as a part of the name. So it will keep on add, adding the results to the object as, as we apply more functions to it. So um, the names are the same. And this one will be longer depending on the u star scenarios that you set. So let's look at the results of the of the uh, of the the new function that we apply. So it looks similar. I mean, of, I mean visually it looks the same, but I'm sure there are there's small differences here and there. And let's look at the fingerprint plot. So this is for the the slop the slop the slop uh, function. So for for this, for the gross primary production, you can see um, this distinct pattern of the NEE uh, compared to the ecosystem respiration. Of course, this is just for one year. Now, after that, all that's done, so we've gone through from creating the object, uh, determining the use of thresholds, data filtering using the thresholds, gap filling, partitioning. Now, you find that uh, you need to do more with the analysis. Uh, you can do it within the object, uh, you, through the object, Although it can be tedious, like I mentioned, or you can export it, and then, or maybe you want to use a different function within another uh, language uh, environment, like MATLAB or Python. So you can export the the data uh, using uh, this ex export data. So remember last time that I mentioned that if you just want to export the original data, then we use this s export data, apply on the object, and put it inside a, a variable. So this writes the original data to GEV data. And if you want to export the other columns, the, the ones that I, sorry, the ones, all this, this additional columns because of the functions that apply on the object, then you should use this uh, S export results. So there's two, uh, because I was confused in the beginning uh, as I was exploring um, RID proc, I said, what's the difference between these two? So they are different because this one just, uh, just exports the data within the, the original data part of the object. Well, this one of well S export results will export the the results of the analysis of from the object. So there's two parts: the GEB data and GEB results. And if you want it to be within one data frame, you just C bind it, and then you just write the data file to frame. So you can keep it in CSV or a text, but in this um, in this example, it's in a text format and put it in the folder results. So that is uh, the exporting. So we talked through all of that. Um, you know the basic workflow. Of course, we're not going into the details of uh, how some things work. But if you like to see how, let me just go straight away to our studio here, uh, not this one. You want to see the guts of the function. Uh, let's see, one last point, Control L. Um, you should always look at the documentation by typing R eddy prop and look at the index. This is what I do anyway. And let's say you are interested in how it works. Uh, let's say maybe SMDS gap field and see how this works. Of course, you can click on that and you can see all the, there are a lot of default uh, value set for the, so you don't have to specify every one, uh, but these are the things that you can change. But if you want to see how the, this thing is coded, then you can always write question mark and type in the name of the function, MDS gap fill, for example, and press enter. Oh, okay, that's the documentation. Or you could just click on that and you see the code itself. How is it calculated? So, um, and you can, sometimes it's good for you to read the paper, see how it works and see how is it translated in the form of code. So this is how it is. Of course, you, you need to spend a bit of time to understand this, but um, it's worth it if you want to customize your own code. 
So I think that should be it for me. Uh, I, I apologize for the technicality, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's more of a getting you, like throwing you into the water of analyzing and seeing the guts of the, the analysis instead of looking at just the theory part. I think that should be it for me. I hope I didn't extend the time and sorry for the internet connection loss in the middle of the talk. I hope it's useful. I think that should be it. No worry. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I think. Uh, Thanks, Doctor. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Hoji. All right. So we have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have five minutes left. So, is there any question from the audience? So yeah, there's one question. Why do we need five twenty-five ninety-five percent threshold? And in the actual situation, do we really use this percentile data? Is that is that for me? Yeah, you, you can answer. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe uh, Peter also has his uh, his take on that. But um, yeah, that's the default quantiles within the package. So if you didn't specify it, then it will use five ninety fifty ninety five. Although you can you can change that. You can use 10%, 20%, 30%. So this becomes useful if you want to calculate the uncertainty. So the more quantiles you have, the more uncertainties, uh, I mean, more accurate the uncertainties estimation would be. But if you have no preference, then yeah, you could use the 550 and 95. It's not 25, it's 50%. Does it answer the question? You knew? Is that... Do for you. Yes. Um, okay. Another question here is. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, I see actually a few more questions before the the link that I gave. Um, can, can I just like I, I answer the ones that uh, I think it's directed to me? Sure, sure, sure. Sure, please. From the top, uh, is there a version of R0 that works best if R80 prop? No, you can, like for me, I would not know how that I need to update until I use a function that requires an update. So you can keep on using the old version of R Studio that you have until it doesn't work. Uh, for me, it still works. So I don't think there's any, plus the R80 prop is not being updated that often. Then, but, but it could update at any time, but it's not that often. So I think any version is fine. I mean, if you just recently downloaded it last year or even two years ago, it still it should still work. Uh, Postit.co correct website. Yes, they they just recently changed the 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 name of the company. That's right. I already answered the fifty percent, ninety five percent. And okay, there is one already prop package data fill for nighttime. So you should check on your meteorological data to see whether they're filled or maybe there are some unreasonable values. Check the meteorology data first and see whether the gap filling, the gap filling is logical. How do we overcome long gap issues? Um, you could use the MODIS uh, aqua I mean, to fill it, although the, those are, uh, uh, the averaging time is not so good, not 30 minutes, but you could use automatic weather station data to, to get filled, but I think maybe Peter has a take on that. How do you deal with long get data? You don't you don't get them in the first place. So <laughs> um, one of the first laws of eddy covariance data processing is that it is easier to record good data from the start than mm -hmm. to try and patch up bad data later on. So the first the first rule is that you don't get long gaps, but when they are inevitable, when they do happen. Uh, long gaps in meteorology are not so problematic because you can use automatic weather station or NWP model or reanalysis data to get for those long gaps in meteorology. Long gaps in the fluxes are more problematic, particularly if there's a change in phenology uh, during the period of the gap. So we have, um, we have uh, sites in the tropical savanna which have a dry season. If you've got a gap that spans the, the, the break of the dry season and into the wet season, then you don't pick up that change in phenology. Um, at that stage, you've got to introduce another uh, source of information that contains that uh, change in phenology or seasonal information, and we use MODIS EVI. You're right that that only comes um, every 16 days, 
you can get a little bit better than 16 days. So we, we do our own processing of modus uh, uh, and our own quality control uh, and try and get it down to eight days or even a bit less, um, rather than using the, the, the ones that are pre-aggregated by um, uh, for you by NOAA. Uh, so we can get a little bit better. Um, but even then, changes that might be happening very rapidly in the space of a day or so due to disturbance or, or harvesting, you're not going to pick up with MODIS either. Uh, at, at that case, I don't know what you do. You make it up. <laughs> but um, yeah. the, I think the best answer is don't get gaps in the first place. Don't get gaps that long in the first place. Even with long gap filling, uh, we use a neural network driven by MODIS EVI. to get It does okay at the break of the dry season into the wet season in tropical savanna, but I, I wouldn't want to push it really hard. Mm -hmm. Once you get gaps of three to six months, it's starting to get really tough to get your things sensible out of these out of any of these methods. Yeah. I think as long as you'll be able to capture, if um, if you think it, uh, think of it uh, like in a like mathematical sense, not really mathematical, like things that change. If you see a lot of changes that happen within season or between seasons, then logically you won't be able to gap fill it because you don't have enough information to gap fill it. Uh, so if you, uh, if things are. Oh no, not again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think now his internet also freezing one more time again. Uh, and we have one, one question about, uh, uh, about the comparison among, uh, among white flags at Red Proc. At the Pi Plus Pro, uh, at is there, uh, is there any any paper about uh, all those uh, all those evaluation among among Pi Plus Pro Y Plus at uh, at the Red Pro package? Is there any paper study published uh, evaluating those uh, th those tools? No, not yet. No, I, 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 do you mean um, comparing, uh, simply comparing the results from different methods, or do you mean a comparison against an independent data set? Because there, there are two different things here. We can, we can compare the results from different processing packages or different processing techniques um, and, and see how well they compare on the comforting assumption that if they all roughly agree, then maybe they're converging on the same answer. That's the correct answer. Uh, but the true test is finding something independent of the eddy covariance method, because there are a number of assumptions that we make along the way, lots of uncertainty in the data. How do we know that the final number we're getting um, is, is something close to reality? And at that stage, you've got to come back to um, looking at data series over five to 10 years, maybe longer, uh, recording of upground biomass, basically coming up with an independent method of estimating the same quantities that we measure off the flux tails. And I think, um, I don't know of any work that's been done comparing a large number or, or more than one or two uh, flux processing. There was a paper with um, Gerardo Frattini and Thomas Morder, I think, that compared Eddie Pro and TK3. I mm. don't think there's been one that compares the post-processing and gap filling and partitioning from different packages. And there have been some papers that try to compare flux tower measurements of net ecosystem exchange with biomass measurements and so on um, with, with you know, pretty varying degrees of success. So there's not a lot of work that's been done. Cool. I, I, do, I see a question there from Nicholas Wright Osmond. who asked a really good question, which is how long of a gap should we just call too long? Um, and that's that's incredibly site specific. Um, if you've got a site in the in the in the the dry season in the tropical savanna, then it's pretty much groundhog day. One day looks like the last day. Um, in that case, you can you can gap fill quite comfortably over several weeks to months. Um, but if you've got as I was saying, if you've got a gap that spans the break between the dry season and the wet season, then a gap of a couple of weeks is going to be difficult to fill without introducing some source of seasonal information. So that's a very site specific question, Nicholas. I'm not sure that there's a single answer for it.
Right. Thank you, Peter and uh, you three. Uh, is there any other questions? <laughs> I've just seen Nicholas's comment. <laughs> In that case, Nicholas, you'll have no you'll have no long gaps at Cumberland Plain. Good sight. <laughs> So, all right, Sims, there's no more questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, I was very honored to have uh, Dr. Peter Isaac and Dr. Yusri Yusuf for the workshop, uh, for this workshop for day two today. And why don't I just uh, give them big applause for today's presentation? All right. Okay. So tomorrow uh, we will uh, have three different uh, speakers from. Japan, Australia, and China. So if you are interested in the, these topics, please join our workshop tomorrow. And if you have any question, please leave your question on our Slack channel here. And after uh, the workshop tomorrow, please uh, take five, five minutes of your time to uh, survey here. And you can also check the recorded video uh, on the Americanos channel. So thank you for your participation today. Um, and thank you for Xiang Min San for hosting this workshop today. And yeah, thanks. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thanks, Hoshin. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. See you okay. tomorrow. Bye. Right. See you. Bye. So we can add add the meeting now. So you can add 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 the meeting.